Chapter One of Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter One Brother and Sister. Forebodings. Nettleton. War. Oh, how much of misery is expressed in that one word. It tells its own tale of woe of blood, of broken hearts and desolated homes, of hopes blighted, of poverty and crime, of plunder, peculation and official tyranny, of murder and sudden death. In short, it develops all the baser passions of the human heart, changing a peaceful world to a world of woe, over which the destroying angel well might weep. Come, O thou angel, peace! the army of the mississippi as it was termed had been unsuccessful in their pursuit of the rebel general price a portion of it or rather the division commanded by general seigel had advanced from springfield missouri upon the wilson creek road as far as the famous battleground rendered immortal by the death of general lyon but finding no enemy it had encamped upon grand prairie a few miles to the west of the bloody field all in camp was upon the tiptoe of expectation. The lovely scene spread out before the view was sufficient to inspire the heart of man to great and glorious deeds. The broad, rolling prairie lay there like heaven's great carpet. The long grass waved in the breeze, presenting the appearance of a deep green sea, undulating in low swells as if Queen Mab's wand were wafting over it. The autumn's frost had changed thousands of the delicate emerald blades to purple, yellow, and scarlet, while intermixed with these was the white prairie flower, lending to the scene an almost fairy-like aspect. The large Fremont tents were arranged in rows in a tasty manner. Flags were flying, bands were discoursing sweet strains which echoed far and wide. Squads of soldiers in vari-coloured uniforms were lounging lazily on the grass, while those detailed for mess or guard duty were busily prosecuting their assigned tasks. To the east of the camp appeared a wall of forest kings, their verdure also touched by the frost, presenting a variety of colours and glistening in the sunlight. Few in that small army had witnessed the horrors of the battlefield, but like all green troops, conceiving that there was much of romance connected with the deadly field, and that heroes were created by a single brave deed. The mass of Seigel's men were eager to meet the foe. It had been given out that the entire army was to join this division on the prairies, and that an advance was to be made at once against Price, who was then at Cassville, some forty miles distant to the southward. "'I think we can safely count upon a desperate battle by the day after to-morrow,' exclaimed one of the party of five, seated within a captain's tent four of whom were at a table, with cups and wine before them. The fifth person was making himself generally useful, acting in the capacity of a servant. "'You have fleshed your maiden's sword at Springfield, and I did not suppose you would be anxious for another fight. I confess I cannot gaze upon such scenes without a shudder, and, if duty would permit, I would willingly sheathe my sword for ever.' "'Captain Hayward, you are low-spirited to-day,' answered the first speaker. "'I am indeed, Lieutenant Wells, and can you wonder? My sister is here.' "'I only wish mine was.' "'That is a rash wish, my friend. She will be exposed to much danger, and I never want mine to gaze upon a battlefield. No, when men cut each other's throats, delicate, sensitive women should not be near.' "'Could you find no way in which to send her from Springfield to St. Louis?' asked Wells. I could have done so by the mail-coach, but, you know, the entire distance of one hundred and thirty miles from Springfield to Rolla, or to Tipton upon the other route, is infested with guerrillas, and I feared to send her. I preferred she should brave the dangers of the camp, or even the battlefield, with me. Captain Hayward bent his head upon his hands, and was silent. It was some moments before any one ventured to speak. All appeared to be oppressed with a strange sadness. At length one of the party, Captain Gilbert, slapping him familiarly upon the shoulder and endeavouring to speak gaily, said, 
come come harry this won't do you must shake off every vestige of blues you are suffering still from the wound you received in the warsaw skirmish and it makes you low-spirited no doubt your sister will be perfectly safe and i know she had much rather be with you to assist you should you need her aid than to be safe in st louis enduring the tortures of suspense Haywood made no reply at this moment a female delicate and fair came tripping lightly into the tent her face wreathed in smiles and her eyes sparkling with delight but as she caught sight of Haywood, she paused and gazed upon him for a moment exhibiting the most intense interest then advancing and placing her hand upon his shoulder she spoke brother Haywood started and clasping her in his arms he pressed her close to his heart for a moment but gazing into his eyes she asked what is the matter dear harry you appear ill the countenance of Haywood underwent an instant change as he replied not ill but somewhat depressed in spirits perhaps in view of what a day may bring forth oh harry she said i hear there is going to be another fight will you have to go into it and leave me should there be a battle i shall endeavour to protect you dear sister but you will be in danger perhaps wounded perhaps killed oh what would i do then don't go harry and the gentle girl threw her arms around her brother's neck and wept after a moment he raised her and pressing his lips to her forehead said i wish to speak with these gentlemen a moment go to your friend alibamo's tent i will come for you soon the sister cast back a look of fond solicitude and left the tent Hayward gazed after her a moment muttering audibly poor child what would you do if i should fall you would indeed be alone now captain i don't think that's half fair exclaimed the one spoken of as being the servant do you think i am such a darn skunk as to if you was killed the darn not to fight for my captain's sister the skunk no i mean if you die if she dummy if i don't i i and the speaker as if unable to express what he did mean suddenly left the tent all present smiled broadly and good humour was thus for the moment infused in all hearts nettleton had a sudden call said one he has gone to the sutlers for a dictionary asked another his heart is in the right place remarked Hayward. that's so responded all with emphasis you are safe with such a darn skunk for your bodyguard captain Hayward. gilbert declared with comic seriousness william nettleton was in height about six feet his general appearance was very singular his hair was nearly white naturally so his eyes of a light green and large his carriage very loose indeed when he walked one would almost expect to see him fall in pieces his feet were huge in dimensions he had the appearance of a half-witted illy formed person but he was withal neither one nor the other having been detached from the company to which he belonged to act as servant to captain Hayward, he soon became so greatly attached and devoted to the captain as to be styled his bodyguard this attachment was not fictitious nor did it proceed from a spirit of military sycophancy or subserviency it was felt nettleton had evinced more than ordinary courage on several occasions and had also displayed so much judgment with his intrepidity that he had received orders of advancement but these he declined preferring as he expressed himself to stay with my captain the first what promoted me it will also be well to explain the presence of ladies in the camp miss mamie hayward was the sister of captain hayward who having received intelligence that her brother was wounded had visited springfield for the purpose of ministering to his wants at the time of her arrival fremont's army of the mississippi was marching upon that place and the journey from rolla or tipton was safe but soon those roads were infested with guerrillas and as they were poorly guarded it was not thought prudent that the ladies who had reached springfield should attempt to return miss hayward therefore remained with her brother this same reason will apply to all the ladies in camp for which there were several conspicuous among whom was the wife of adjutant hinton one of the officers of the well-known benton cadets she was usually addressed as alibamo her name when a captive in price's hands she was very beautiful 
and of that daring determined nature which has immortalized so many women of the west in company with alibamo was a young lady who acted in the capacity of waiting-maid but who really appeared more like a companion this female possessed the not particularly euphonious name of sally long no wells you informed me of your affection i must join with nettleton in my reproaches captain hayward answered lieutenant wells in a subdued tone you forget my conversation with you last night no wells you informed me of your affection for my sister but you have never addressed her as a lover how do you know that she will return your love if she could return it i confess lieutenant i do not know any one to whom i would more willingly see her united but if she cannot how could you assume to become her protector if such should be the case and the fortunes of war should deprive her of a brother rest assured that not only myself but every man in camp would willingly shed his blood in her defence and care for her as a sister thank you i do feel a foreboding of evil i believe i shall be killed in the coming battle and if this should be the case i commend her to your care but my nerves are excited i will walk into the open air no i would be alone he added as one of the officers arose as if to accompany him as he left the tent one of the party a captain walker exclaimed well i hope things are all right but i have my doubts your doubts of what asked wells <laughs> well no matter you are too directly interested to listen to the explanation but perhaps you will find out some day do you intend sir to cast any slur upon captain hayward captain walker did not reply but left the tent an hour or more had passed and hayward did not return it was now quite dark when suddenly the assembly was sounded and all anxious the troops fell in the order was read pack knapsacks and have everything in readiness for a move at daylight all was excitement and every preparation was made for a forward movement but soon it began to be whispered that the orders were to return in a short time it was officially announced that the movement was in reality back to springfield and from thence to rolla and st louis many were the expressions of disappointment and regret and some even ventured to denounce the policy fremont had been superseded in the field and general hunter his successor had abandoned the campaign then on the very eve of its final consummation End of chapter 1chapter two of prisoner of the mill this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org prisoner of the mill by harry hazelton chapter two the tragedy of the stream who was guilty when captain hayward left the tent he proceeded to the stream which skirted the woods bending over it he bathed his fevered brow then he seated himself upon the bank of the river and resting his head upon his hands was for a long time absorbed in his thoughts a human form flitted lightly past hayward raised his head and listened but all was quiet again and in the darkness of the night he could distinguish nothing i was mistaken he said to himself if i was not and a human being is around i will wager it was nettleton who anxious for my safety has followed me the captain was again silent for a moment when the breaking of a twig betrayed the presence of some person hayward raised his head and called william william nettleton sir answered a voice but a few feet from the captain why did you follow me william cause i'm a darn skunk drawled the person addressed as he emerged out of the darkness and curse you the person speaking was before him in an instant hayward sprung to his feet but with a cry of agony exclaimed great god nettleton why have you oh god save me you've killed me i die and falling heavily forward the words died upon his tongue the murderer bent over the murdered for a moment then with some haste rolled the body into the water and turned from the spot 
he paused under the shade of a tree and listened for the tread of a sentry that he might enter the camp unobserved with a half-suppressed laugh he uttered his thoughts i have done it sure and now that it is done i must progress no retreating now i think i'll win good-bye captain and give my respects to my friends as you float downstream he proceeded with caution toward the camp and was soon lost in the city of canvas the tattoo soon sounded lights were extinguished and all was quiet save in a few tents which appeared to be those of officers yet there were aching hearts within that camp and as the night progressed many were the anxious inquiries as to why captain haywood did not return in a large tent near that occupied by captain haywood were seated three ladies one was miss haywood another was alibamo or as she is now a wife she should be called mrs adjutant hinton the other was miss sally long the waiting maid of alibamo before the tent paced a special guard beside it was a tent of much smaller dimensions occupied by nettleton and his servant black george or as nettleton used to call him swayze's nigger i fear something has befallen my brother he does not return and it is now twelve o'clock don't be alarmed said alibamo in a soothing voice your brother is most likely at the headquarters of general Seigel he may be detained on business come let us retire no not while my brother is absent at this moment the guard came to the tent entrance and said ladies if you have not yet retired captain walker requests the pleasure of a few words with miss haywood oh alibamo i fear that man he looks at me so strangely but perhaps he brings news of my brother i will see him bid the captain enter as walker entered he appeared agitated but controlling his emotions he said ladies you will pray excuse me i feel that i must speak now as it may be my last opportunity we or i should say the army will be separated at springfield and i shall see you no more do you bring news of my brother asked miss hayward no his disappearance is very strange but i came to speak of myself what would you say this miss hayward i have loved you long and dearly to-morrow we may be parted and i would ask you should the fortunes or rather the misfortunes of war deprive you of a brother's love and protection will you not permit me to seek you out and become your future protector captain walker these words surprise me and i think propriety demanded that they should have been spoken in the presence of my brother pardon me dear lady i have waited until this hour for your brother's return and at last fearing i should have no other opportunity i ventured to visit you now you have a friend and sister in alibamo and surely you will not fear to speak before her i cannot answer your question it refers to the future then for the present let me speak plainly and i beg you will do the same can you not at least regard me now as your friend and protector and give me a friend's privileges the timid girl turned towards alibamo and in an inaudible voice spoke a word she answers promptly no replied alibamo somewhat sterner than was her usual manner you love another then asked walker miss hayward did not reply is the favoured one lieutenant wells again asked walker you are impertinent captain walker replied alibamo i must request you to retire how can you thus in her brother's absence address her in this manner at this moment there was a commotion in the tent of nettleton the voice of a negro was heard exclaiming i heard you massa nettleton there ain't no use in you denying it i heard massa captain say oh nettleton you kill me oh lord if ever i get out of dis scrape you'll never catch dis child in such another one is the nigger crazy what is the darn skunk talking about oh you needn't make believe ignoramus in dis say a question i heard ye 
now look her here you unconscionable dark if you have got anything to say spit it out don't make a darn skunk of yourself oh won't i fetch you up in the morning yes sir are you going to speak and say what you mean oh golly you go back on de cap'n that way what cap'n out with it or i'll break your head and every bone in your body exclaimed nettleton in a state of undisguised excitement serve this nigger as ye did de captain and den put his body in de river the negro had scarcely uttered these words when nettleton seized him he set up a terrible howl which brought captain walker to their tent what is all this fuss about asked walker the negro went on to explain as follows why ye see massa captain i went over to dat yer house cross de river to see miss julia a cold gal dat used to be my sweetheart well i see de johnnies comin and i ran down to de river and come on dis side but they come so close to me dat dis child hid behind a big log then they stop right by me and say golly we can't catch nobody then i heard someone on the other side of the river say oh nettleton you silence this stuff you have been drunk if you speak upon this subject again i'll cut your black throat i see dumb massa cap'n quiet had now been restored and all parties retired for the few hours that intervened before morning but it was evident all were not asleep several times a stealthy step was heard and a shadow flitted past the white canvas tent dimly seen by the pale starlight morning came at last and all was astir captain hayward had not yet returned an inquiry was made if any one had seen him i have not seen him since last evening at twilight replied walker at which time he acted very strangely and talked about the injustice of war i'm inclined to think he has deserted and joined the enemy oh you damn skunk yelled nettleton as he sprang forward and was about to strike the speaker but checking himself he added it's well you wear them gilt things on your shoulders or i'd teach you to call my captain such names if you would save yourself trouble you had better remain quiet nettleton replied walker as he fixed his eyes significantly upon him i knows where cap'n hayward am said the negro stepping forward where is he sobbed miss hayward pressing forward in her eagerness he is silence yelled walker let him speak said the colonel go on george where is the captain down dar the negro trembled violently and glanced at nettleton what do you mean he's in de river killed dead sure a wild shriek rose upon the air as miss hayward fell back into the arms of alibamo insensible by whom was he killed by massa nettleton da sure i heard across de river just as plain as day nettleton started back in horror his eyes extending widely and his frame trembling a general murmur of disbelief ran through the crowd did you see him do the deed asked the colonel golly i couldn't see much it was so dark but i hear massa captain say oh nettleton you kill me golly see how massa nettleton shake where was this right down by that tree his blood is all over the ground i just see it in an instant nettleton had dashed off for the spot indicated in accordance with an order from the colonel he was pursued reaching the locality named he gazed upon the ground it was red with blood fresh blood he threw himself upon the earth and wept and moaned and called upon his captain to return his grief was terrible to behold by this time the officers and many of the men had arrived they gazed upon the grief-stricken servant with respect and more than one expression of sympathy was heard if captain hayward has been murdered it was not by that boy nettleton loved his captain too much to harm him said lieutenant wells i am inclined to think the deed has been done by skulking guerrillas i incline to your opinion lieutenant wells as to the innocence of nettleton but as to the deed having been done by guerrillas 
it is not likely it is much too near camp but Hayward certainly had no enemy in our camp who would have done this deed. "'We do not know the secret motives which animate the human heart,' replied Walker, in a tone and manner not devoid of meaning. "'Let instant search be made for the body,' commanded the colonel. It was done, but no trace of it could be found, although the water was too shallow to have permitted it to float down the river. Attention was again directed to Nettleton, who was sitting erect gazing at a piece of sharp bloody steel which he held in his hand viewing it a moment he sprung to his feet and fixed his eyes upon lieutenant wells then he turned to the colonel and handed him the blade the officer examined it directing his gaze upon lieutenant wells he asked has any one among you a small spanish dirk with a highly polished and ornamented blade i had such a one replied wells but i have missed it for several days the colonel instantly turned toward the camp commanding all to follow him he halted before the tent of lieutenant wells and said you captain walker and you adjutant hinton enter this tent and tell me what you find the search lasted but a moment during which time wells had been assisting miss hayward but not without evincing much agitation. Walker now appeared, holding in his hand a bowl of bloody water, and exhibiting the broken stiletto, covered with blood, which had been found in the overcoat pocket of Wells. A shirt also was found, which was stained with blood. "'What can you say to this damning proof of your guilt?' asked the Colonel. "'I know nothing of it.' "'Arrest the murderer of Captain Harry Hayward demanded the colonel in a loud voice the guards instantly seized him murderer he a murderer and of my brother no no this is some dreadful dream oh tell me my brother is not murdered it will kill me oh see pity a friendless girl who kneels to you and begs you to tell her that you have not deprived her of a dear brother speak to me edward i did love you and you would not harm him wells could not speak he had never spoken to miss hayward of his love for her but now in her delirium of her grief she had confessed her love for him oh what a moment walker advanced to raise miss hayward from her bended position before wells pause off ye dern skunk yelled nettleton as he hurled walker to the ground i alone am her protector now End of chapter two Chapter Three of Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter Three The Proposal, The Interruption, The Indian, The Rescue the wounded man the mystery near the village of ozark at the base of a ridge of mountains of that name runs a most beautiful stream or river which bears the name of the village and is one of the tributaries of the north fork of the gasconade its banks are high and covered with a thick but small growth of the scrub oak peculiar to that portion of missouri the bed of the river sparkles with brilliant white and yellow pebbles polished by the rush of waters for thousands of years a fine bridge spans the stream along the main road that runs through the only opening in the forest for miles around after crossing this bridge and ascending a sharp hill the village of ozark is reached this consists of about twenty ordinary-looking dwellings a courthouse and a rough building dignified by the name hotel beyond the village and higher up the mountain is a line of rolling hills which overlook the country for miles around on one of these and near the edge of a grove were to be seen a cluster of tents and from the number of horses picketed but a short distance away it would at once be supposed from a distance 
to be a cavalry camp with perhaps a section of artillery on a sloping point extending from the side of the bridge to the stream and reclining upon the turf were two persons the one a young man of marked appearance and the other a female of much beauty though her dress bespoke her a native of that portion of the country nettie when do you expect your sister to return it is difficult to answer charles but i trust very soon have you not heard from her recently no there is no way in which she can communicate with me the mails have been discontinued you are aware from rolia to springfield if you can visit the army i presume you can both dispatch and receive letters are you not very anxious to learn how she is treated among the federals i am most anxious still i have no fears i cannot feel as you do upon that subject i will not awaken useless fears in your breast but i have not so much confidence in their magnanimous natures charles you told me to-day for the first time that you loved me and asked me if i could not address you as dear charles you have been very kind to me and on one occasion you rescued me from the hands of a villain i feel grateful truly so but whatever my feelings may be i can never wed my country's enemy look yonder you see that white cottage once it was beautifully adorned with creeping vines and the lawn before it bloomed with flowers and shrubbery but dearer than all within its walls lived my father and my sister look at it now its beauty has departed it is a wreck father and sister have been driven from it while i have been detained here by force you profess to love me if you do so prove it we are now more than a mile from the rebel camp and you can escape with me to springfield i will assist you to escape indeed i will accompany you a portion of the way to springfield but i must return to my own people and fight with them to the last i do love you and i would become your husband gladly if i could be satisfied you loved me for myself alone but i cannot sacrifice one jot of honor or principle to win even you dear nettie and you will go with me now yes yes stay what is that do you not hear a low moaning sound i heard nothing well perhaps i am mistaken but i fancied i heard a sound no matter i will go with you now to springfield to what purpose young man the speaker was a powerful person and had emerged from the bridge just in time to hear the last sentence of charles campbell so sir he continued you would desert us and join the yankees and all for your foolish regard for this vixen colonel price if you were not an officer i would make you eat your words i have served you faithfully and you have no right to question my loyalty i do not intend to desert neither is this lady a vixen any more than you are a coward price started bit his lips and frowned fiercely at length he said why did you propose visiting springfield with this lady i intended to accompany her a portion of the way and then to return to my duty why does she wish to visit springfield because her father and sister are both in st louis and she wishes to rejoin them did not yonder cottage belong to her father it did he was one of the most bitter opposers in this section and you love his abolition daughter i love his daughter sir enough you will return to camp this moment i will take charge of this young lady when i rejoin you i shall put your loyalty and your courage to the test do you see yonder boat he pointed up the river a small boat was seen floating down the stream in which three men were sitting erect and the form of a fourth lying prostrate how do you propose testing my loyalty colonel price 
that boat contains a yankee officer he is to be hung up by the neck you shall perform the job is not that man wounded colonel price yes very badly so i am informed then i will not perform the base thing you propose price drew a revolver and pointing it to the head of campbell commanded him to start at once for camp he had scarcely done so when a powerful indian sprung from concealment and snatched the weapon from his hand at the same time he seized price as if he had been a child and hurled him into the water below without waiting to watch the result of this sudden immersion upon the chivalrous colonel he caught the maiden in his arms and bounded off in the direction of springfield as he started he beckoned to the young man and muttered come follow me save her price floundered about in the water for a moment and finally succeeded in reaching the shore just as the boat came up come quick join me in the pursuit yelled price the three men leaped upon the bank and at the command of price all discharged their pieces after the retreating indian but without effect pursuit was then ordered but price observing that campbell did not follow turned and asked are you not coming sir no was the prompt reply price felt for his revolver but finding it gone he only muttered curse you and then commenced the pursuit for over a mile it was kept up the pursuers gained upon the indian who was considerably obstructed in his flight by the weight of the female at last price exclaimed by the eternal there come the yankees sure enough just appearing in view upon an elevated point a little beyond was seen a squadron of cavalry and a section of flying artillery rapidly advancing to the hill give the signal for our guns to the bridge secure the prisoner in the boat these commands were given by price as he commenced a rapid retreat toward the bridge pausing on the hill just before reaching it he unfurled a small flag and made a signal in an instant all was astir in the rebel camp and artillery and cavalry soon came dashing down the hill where is the prisoner yelled price as he came to the bridge perhaps the young man you left here has taken him to camp but the boat is gone however there is no time to be lost now they are upon us quick colonel price started for the opposite end of the bridge followed by his three confederates the rebel troops were still some distance from that end of the bridge nearest their camp which it was evident they intended reaching if possible in order to sweep the narrow passage if the union forces attempted to cross the federals however were the first to gain that point but had a crossing been effected as soon as they reached the opposite side they would have been exposed to the most galling fire of the enemy as there was a large space of flat swampy ground in front and then a sharp bluff upon which the rebel artillery would in such a case be planted the commander of the federals observing this situation at a glance ordered a halt and brought his section of artillery into position one piece was placed so as to enfilade the bridge and the other upon a little rise of ground in a position where it could sweep their lines beyond the rebels observing this threw forward two guns amid a deadly fire from the unionists and succeeded in taking a position upon the opposite end of the bridge several rounds of grape were hurled back and forth but as the cover was good but little damage was done the cavalry attempted a crossing but the thick growth of oaks prevented a charge was about to be ordered across the bridge when an explosion took place and it was shattered to fragments taking advantage of this the rebels made a rapid flight as pursuit was useless the command was given to fall back to springfield the indian we have spoken of now approached the commander leading the trembling woman and said me save 
you save white squaw do you require my protection asked the commander nettie told her story in an artless manner of which the reader has gleaned all necessary particulars she was kindly provided for and soon reached springfield in perfect safety soon after the arrival a soldier came to the tent of the commanding officer presenting a bit of paper colonel i picked up this scrap near the bridge but did not look at it until this moment it may be of importance the colonel took the paper and read aloud a suspicion of my fidelity to the confederate cause has crossed the mind of my commanding officer lieutenant colonel a m price simply because i consented to assist miss nettie morton to reach springfield from which point she might be able to rejoin her friends who formerly resided in ozark but are now in st louis i was condemned in consequence to be the executioner of a wounded federal officer at this cowardly act my whole nature revolted chance has favored me and i have determined to save him in what matter i cannot here write fearing this paper should fall into confederate hands and my plans be thus interrupted i cannot learn who he is i asked his name and i have some reason to believe that miss morton may throw some light upon the subject as the only words he spoke were net murdered sister he bore the rank of captain charles campbell the colonel turned toward miss morton who was seated in his tent and asked do you feel any especial interest in any union officer now with us miss morton hung her head and blushed do not fear to speak and frankly too miss morton perhaps the welfare of one you love perhaps his safety may depend upon your candid confession i i have you ever met one of our officers but once and then i only passed the evening in his society he was kind but he has forgotten me it is enough you love him but the short time he was with you could scarcely have made an impression so deep that he would mutter your name in his delirium and yet the wounded man was near your residence and he exclaimed net your name is nettie is it not it is and what is the name of him you refer to captain harry hayward the officer was visibly affected nettie net nettleton murdered sister it is very strange harry hayward's body was not found but he was assassinated ah i begin to fathom the mystery he murmured all this in words not audible to the astonished miss morton and left the tent slowly as if oppressed with the weight of a momentous thought End of chapter three chapter four of prisoner of the mill this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by siobhan mckelpin prisoner of the mill by harry hazelton chapter four nettleton's adventure in a noose some important information the surprise of walker was very great at the unexpected movement of nettleton his sword flashed from its scabbard and he made a half pass at his breast but checking himself he said william i can forgive you in consideration of your grief and i spare you that you may assist in the care of miss hayward curse him he muttered to himself i would strike the infernal dog dead at my feet but the act would only place a greater barrier between me and my prize miss hayward he added aloud you will always find me ready and most anxious to serve you miss hayward will not for lack of friends sir replied alibamo in a tone of contempt captain walker i shall place the prisoner in your charge you will forward at once these words were spoken by the colonel walker bit his lip and was silent he then commanded the guard to forward muttering as he did so the second most agreeable job 
I'll refrench myself upon him. As the guard formed around Lieutenant Wells, he turned to Miss Hayward and said, Oh, dear lady, you have inadvertently confessed that you have some regard for me. This is not the time to speak of such things, but I will now say to you that which has never before passed my lips, excepting to your brother. I love you with a devotion, ardent as it is pure and holy, and that by love I swear and beg you to believe that I have never harmed your brother. Miss Hayward turned toward him and made a movement as if to reach his side, but Walker held aloft the bloody knife, which met her gaze, and, with a shudder, she turned to Alabama. Forward, cried Walker, and Edward Wells, the once popular officer and general favorite, was urged on, bound and guarded, charged with, and generally believed guilty of, the foulest of crimes. But yesterday he was on the road to honor and fame. Now he was marching forward to a disgraceful death, the entire division was soon in motion. Nettleton now approached Miss Hayward and said, Miss Mamie, I am going to do all for you that such a dark skin, I mean, a chap as me can do, but I'm feared I ain't much. But you're going now where there ain't no danger, and if you please, I'm going to stay behind and hunt for the captain. Oh, thank you, William, sobbed Miss Hayward. How can I ever repay you, dear friend? Don't don't said william a choking sensation came over him and unable to say more he turned away only to be comforted by miss sally long who placed her hands upon his shoulders and said william if you find the captain i'll love you dearly nettleton started back opened his eyes wide so he did his mouth as if attempting to speak his lower jaw wagged two or three times but no sound was heard then turning his eyes he saw the gaze of all fixed upon him and started off suddenly upon a run exclaiming as he did so who ever thought it possible that i should ever be loved by sally such a darn skunk a, a sweet gal i mean nettleton did not pause until he had overtaken the colonel of whom he requested permission to remain and make a more thorough search for his captain no william was the reply we will not be a mile distant before the enemy's scouts will be here and you will be taken prisoner no fear they don't notice such as me but your uniform will be sufficient oh i always go prepared i have another suit under this one that i got from the bushwhack i laid out the other night as he come nosing up around captain hayward's tram ground and i shall put that on top well do as you like but be careful nettleton waited for no other words but turning proceeded at once to the spot where hayward received the fatal stab he sat down for a time silent and mournful gazing into the water he then commenced a scrutinizing search he became satisfied that the body could not have floated down the river on account of the shallowness of the water he crossed the stream searched upon the opposite bank and there found the footprints of a number of men he followed the tracks and found that two persons had descended into the river and out again near the same spot he took the measurements of each impression in the mud and then exclaimed i'll be darned if lieutenant wells boot made any of them marks i know how it is cap must have come here last night to think and some of them darn rebel skunks come up behind him suddenly and killed him and then two of them crossed over got his body and brought it back and that accounts for the tracks in and out of the water. But what did they want with him if he were dead? Perhaps he wasn't quite killed, and they took him prisoner. I'll follow these tracks, anyway. Nettleton followed up the footmarks until they merged into the turnpike, which was so cut up with travel as to prevent him tracing them further. He now returned to the fatal spot. Bending down, he examined the earth, still red with blood something appeared to interest him and creeping on his knees he followed a footprint to the edge of the stream here was the impression of two boots side by side in the mud nettleton gazed upon them for a few moments his breast heaved violently he clenched his hands and at last said i've blacked them boots i know em well there is the impression of two hearts in the mud and there ain't but what pair of boots in our camp that has two hearts made with nails in the ball of each foot oh you darn 
something caught the eye of Nettleton in the water. He sprung in and secured it. It proved to be a handkerchief, which bore a name upon the corner. He gazed upon it a moment and said, The man as had them boots stood in them tracks, washed himself in that river. He wiped his handkerchief and that threw it in the water. Folks as washes the evidence of murder off their hands. Don't wash in the river, throw away the wiper, and then take a tin pot of bloody water to... What the devil are you doing here? Nettleton turned to behold a party of six horsemen who had suddenly approached him. In his anxiety, he had forgotten to change his clothing, that is, to cover his blue uniform with the rough gray suit he wore underneath. So, you were a Yankee soldier, exclaimed one of the party. No, I ain't. I'm a darn skunk. This reply, and the ungainly appearance of Nettleton, caused a laugh throughout the entire party. You're not a Yankee soldier? Then what are you doing in that uniform? Nettleton looked at his dress, and for the first time became conscious that he had not changed it. He, however, instantly replied, I am a spy for the general. What general? General Price, to be sure. This created another fit of merriment. <laughs> Just as if the likes of you would be employed as a spy. Why, you don't even know enough to last you half a mile. That's just the reason why I am a spy. I am such a darn skunk that no one pays any attention to me. Have you been in the Yankee camp here? Yes. Have you a Confederate uniform under that blue? Yes, replied Nettleton, throwing off his coat and exposing the gray. To what company and regiment do you belong? No company. I go on my own hook. You know General Price? Yeah, very well. Have you ever been in his camp? Often. Describe him. Nettleton had, on one occasion, accompanied a party of disguised Union officers into the very camp of Price, while that general held possession of the Upper Osage. One of the officers, being detected and wounded, was borne along with the retreating rebel army from the Osage to Springfield, and Nettleton had followed on for the purpose of rendering assistance if possible. His apparent stupidity prevented suspicion, and he had been one of the leading spirits in a rescue which afterward occurred. He was, in consequence, not only known to General Price himself, but to a large number of his officers and men, and hence it was very desirable for him to avoid the main army. He supposed that he could deceive his captors or effect his escape, and the shadowy thought that Captain Hayward might have been seized and borne toward the rebel quarters at once decided his course. He gave an accurate description of Price. Good, answered one of the party. It is evident you are a spy. I find you on the spot the Yankees have just left. You have their uniform and ours under it. So far that looks well. You know you have perfectly described our general. That renders it certain you have seen him. Now one of two things is certain. You are a Yankee spy, and have been in our camps with that gray uniform outside, and then communicated your information to your general. Or, you're a Confederate spy, who, just having been to the Yankee camp, must have some important information for our general. In either case, we shall conduct you to him. If you are his man, then you will be all right. And if you are not, then you will be hung within a half hour after your arrival. You understand? I first thought of going on to Springfield, but I think I have all the information necessary, and I have made up my mind to return. I halted here a moment to change my dress and to look for a Yankee officer who was supposed to be killed last night, but I think he was only badly wounded and may yet be found alive in the tall grass. Look for him. These words were spoken by Nettleton in an apparent cheerful tone. Oh, you mean the captain who was stabbed last night? Yes, yes. Do you know anything of him? You appear especially anxious, Mr. What's-your-name? I am anxious, replied Nettleton fiercely. He insulted me, and I would be revenged. Don't trouble yourself. He'll catch it soon enough. He was not killed, but was taken out of the water by us. Who struck the blow? yelled Nettleton. Not one of our party. We were concealed upon the opposite bank. We could not see the murderer strike, for it was too dark. But we saw the body thrown in the stream and saw the stabber wash himself in the river. We would have fired upon him, but we were afraid of rousing the Yanks. We waited until he left the body, after throwing it into the stream, and then we recovered it. 
the man was still alive he had only fainted from loss of blood we dressed his wound as well we could and then conveyed to him a house on the other side of the pike he will recover but colonel price is in a special spite against him he met him once at springfield so when he recovers he will be hung where is he now asked nettleton a little house not fifty rods from here and just on the other side of the pike without a word nettleton bounded like a deer in the direction the federal forces had taken but a dozen shots were fired after him and he fell he was soon secured when it was ascertained that one bullet had cut the neck badly and another had struck the ankle although it had not broken the bone he was still able to walk and after being bound he was dragged forward towards cassville a march of forty miles was almost too much for even the tough nettleton more especially as he had received a severe shot in the ankle but he bore up firmly and at last arrived to the outskirts of the rebel camp he had become very lame and rolled about like a ship in a heavy sea as he entered the camp many were the jeers and taunts which hailed the specimen of the yankee soldier nettleton made no reply although his countenance bespoke his contempt he was now near the quarters of price by thunder yelled one of the confederate soldiers that is the very fellow who fooled us at springfield hang him hang him an explanation was soon made and nettleton's fate appeared certain as a drumhead court-martial had already been convened sentence was soon given the yankee spy was to be hung upon the spot a rough scaffolding was formed under a large tree and a rope with the fatal noose attached thrown over a limb nettleton ascended the platform in silence although his face trembled i never saw a yankee that yet did not fear to die exclaimed one of the bystanders then you see one now you darn skunk replied nettleton why do you tremble then asked the confederate i was thinking of the captain and his poor sister mamie <laughs> this booby's in love a romantic spy and the idol of his passion is called mamie you lie you dog yelled nettleton i only what is all this asked a stately looking officer who had just approached and before whom all the rest fell back a spy general was the response why was he not brought to my quarters because Raines offered a drumhead court-martial release the man until i have conversed with him nettleton was released and as he descended from the scaffolding he was recognized by general price we have met before asked price yes general we have was the prompt reply of nettleton what were you doing in my camp the first time we met serving my captain who i love good what are you doing here now that will require considerable explanation added nettleton go on said price well general some darn skunk murdered my captain and when our troops left grand prairie on their return to springfield i remained behind to search for his body i am no spy but you said you were a spy serving general price replied one of these soldiers who had brought nettleton to the rebel camp how can you explain this asked price well you see general miss sally no i mean miss mamie that's captain's sister will break her poor heart and die of grief if she can't learn something about her brother the darn skunks has arrested me told me that captain hayward was not killed besides this as nice as a darn sk i mean as good a man as ever lived and one who loves miss sally no uh, that miss sally keeps running in my head one as loves miss mamie is accused of murdering the captain but i know better for i found proof enough to convict the right one i wanted to tell mamie that sally darn sally that her brother was not dead and to clear lieutenant wells and convict him of the one that did his deed so i told them sneaks as how i was a spy in hopes that they'd leave me alone would you give any information you may have gleaned here if i should set you free i ain't no darn skunk general honor is honor bright with me what have you seen here a lot of the darndest stap heads i ever met if i should set you free will you fight against me like the devil the first time we meet in fair play why do you wear that gray suit under your uniform cause captain's always getting himself into some scrape and i have to hunt him up 
Sometimes I have to go among the Johnnies to do it, and then the blue ain't healthy. Will you ever act as a spy upon me if I let you go? Not unless Captain does. But I'm his bodyguard. She'll go everywhere he does if I can. What is your name? William Nettleton. Well, William, I think we shall be obliged to hang you. All right, General, answered Nettleton, stepping upon the scaffolding again. And the darn sneaks shan't say they never seen a Yankee die bravely. But, General, let me ask you one favor. You don't want to see a good fellow shot for what he didn't do, and a murderer go clear, do you? Certainly not. Then all I ask is that you send this handkerchief to Colonel Mann and tell him that the murderer didn't wash in a basin in his tent, but in the river, and then threw his wiper away, and that the guilty one has two hearts made with nails on the sole of each boot, and then tell Sally, no, Mamie, that the captain is, uh, Lieutenant Wells, and Walker, the skunk, when I'm dead, that Sally, no, no captain, won't think of poor Nettleton, and, oh, stop, stop, William, I can never recollect all this. You had better go yourself and attend to the matter. What, General, do you mean it? cried William as he sprung from the scaffold and gazed earnestly at Price. On one condition I will permit you to go. Well, what is it? That as soon as you have given your evidence in the court-martial, which will probably be ordered, you will return at once and be hung. I'll do it. I'm a loafer if I don't. You swear it? Yes, by the great jumpin' jingo and Sally Long's tearful eyes. The guard will see this man safely beyond our lines, said Price, speaking to one of his officers, and furnish him a pass and a horse. Let one of our men accompany him to the federal lines and bring back the animal which William will ride. Nettleton rushed forward and, grasping the hand of Price, shook it violently and exclaimed as he took his lead, General Price, you ain't such a darn sneak as I thought you was. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter 5 The Court Martial and the Hostage. The division which had been encamped on Grand Prairie reached Springfield in safety and formed their temporary camp in the field back of the brick schoolhouse, which stands about a quarter of a mile to the west of the new courthouse. The first order issued to the officers of the battalion of Benton Cadets, the 35th and 37th Illinois, was to assemble at a given time to act upon a court-martial at the quarters of Major D., Judge Advocate, to try the case of Lieutenant Edward Wells, charged with the willful murder of Harry Haywood, a captain in the service of the United States of America, and attached to the Army of the Mississippi, now under command of Major General Hunter. It was a sad day. Lieutenant Wells was a favorite with both officers and men of his command. He always had been mild as a female, kind and benevolent, sacrificing his own comfort for the good of the privates in his battalion. True, some said that Wells would not fight bravely, that he ought to have been created a woman, but everybody gave him credit for being the kindest of the kind. When first accused, there arose a very bitter feeling against him. Captain Hayward also was a great favorite with the men. He was a stern but kind soldier. When the news of his brutal murder came to the knowledge of his boys, their first cry was revenge, and they naturally sought someone on whom to wreak their vengeance. At first, Lieutenant Wells narrowly escaped a summary fate, more especially as it was whispered about camp that Wells had become a suitor for the hand of the fair Mamie Hayward had been rejected by her and spurned by the captain but in a short time it was given out that mamie had confessed her affection for wells and that captain hayward had remarked in the presence of others that he deemed wells an honorable man and would gladly favor his suit this turned the tide of feeling in favor of the lieutenant 
and when the court-martial was convened nothing but a conscientiousness of a soldier's duty prevented an open revolt or at least a most decided and forcible expression of feeling but trusting to the judgment of the officers forming the court the soldiers decided to await the result have our readers ever witnessed a trial by court-martial it is not like the ordinary court of justice first the charge is read as thus lieutenant edward wells of company h battalion of b blank c blank is charged with the willful murder of harry hayward a captain in the u s army second specification first in this that said lieutenant edward wells did on the night of the seventh day of november eighteen sixty one assassinate and murder said etc following this in any case of the kind would be found a list of specifications setting forth in detail all the chief events connected with the crime the prisoner was brought to the tent of major d to answer to the charge he was very pale yet perfectly composed and when the question was asked the ready and firm response was not guilty the judge advocate a noble-hearted but just man informed the prisoner that he was to act not only as prosecuting counsel but as counsel for the prisoner and that he the judge advocate must give the prisoner the benefit of any doubt that might arise in his favor to those of our readers not familiar with the modus operandi of a court-martial we would give the following information for their benefit the doors of the court are closed to all outsiders the prisoner makes his plea and retires the witnesses are brought forward and examined but no cross-examination is allowed if a question is to be asked by any of the officers sitting upon the court it must be reduced to writing and silently handed to the judge advocate if he sees fit to put the question it is done if not it is thrown aside we will now proceed to a brief summary of the trial lieutenant edward wells you are charged with the willful murder of harry hayward a captain in the united states service what is your plea guilty or not guilty not guilty was the decided response let the first witness be called george swasey colored the person familiarly known as swasey's nigger took the stand when brought forward he glanced around as if fearful of something and then asked is massa william nettleson where he can hear dis child tell de truth you have nothing to fear from any person if you do speak the truth and all the truth replied major d well den de fact dem dis i went to see my gal when i come back i met de rebs i hid behind a log i'd seed someone stick a knife in massa cabin and i heard him say oh nettleton you kill me all questions were answered in this same spirit and it became evident that the negro believed nettleton the real murderer the next witness brought upon the stand was alabama hinton she swore that nettleton's tent was next to the one she occupied that he was in attendance upon her and miss hayward by permission of captain hayward and that nettleton had not been out of her presence that night in the first part of the evening nettleton had remained near her door in the latter part he had missed his captain and had prostrated himself on a rug near the tent entrance she had seen him there all night as she had not slept at all miss hayward was too much overcome to appear as a witness and was excused the next witness was captain hugh walker the feeling of the soldiers to learn the result of the trial was intense and by the time captain walker was called to the stand some twenty or thirty had crept to the edge of the tent and endeavored to conceal themselves in the tall grass outside to catch the proceedings 
but they were discovered by walker who demanded that they should be removed this was done and a guard placed outside captain walker's oath was as follows on the night of the seventh of november i followed captain hayward from his tent it was at the time gradually becoming dark my motive in doing so i will explain as soon as it began to be rumored that we were to meet price i observed a change in the conduct of captain hayward he had ever been the centre of attraction his tent was the headquarters of our circle drawn thither by the natural gaiety of the captain and the presence there of ladies but this feeling appeared to forsake him and on more than one occasion he denounced the war as inhuman pardon me i would not speak against the dead but i doubted the loyalty of the man and not his courage and this it was which induced me to follow him i halted beneath a large tree which stood near the spot where the murder evidently was committed i saw the captain seat himself upon the bank at this time it was quite dark but i saw a shadow approaching it passed near me but i failed to discover who it was i first thought it might be william nettleton following his master i listened attentively however as the extreme caution of the intruder attracted my attention in an instant i heard a groan a heavy fall and a voice exclaimed oh william where are you nettleton i am murdered wells is the assassin a shudder ran through the court major d dropped his head upon his hand and was silent the officers whispered together at last a written question was handed to the judge advocate which was promptly asked captain walker why did you not give the alarm or arrest the murderer yourself sir was the prompt reply the sequel will show it was dark i could not distinguish the features of any person two yards distant i feared he might escape if he should discover me i therefore followed the murderer cautiously and he entered the tent of lieutenant wells he did not strike a light but i listened and heard him washing himself i kept close watch upon him until morning to make sure i wasn't accusing an innocent man no one entered or left the tent the one who washed his hands and left the bloody water was lieutenant edward wells this evidence was conclusive but no reason could be assigned for the murder unless it was that miss hayward had been heard to say that she never should marry and leave her brother so long as he lived and it had now become well known that wells was a suitor for her hand still he was a favorite with the captain and even on the day of his death hayward had been heard to say that he believed wells a man of honor whose suit he would favor the only conclusion which could be arrived at was that wells believed the love of a sister was too strong to give immediate place to the love of a wife and he felt that the brother once removed he alone would become the object of miss hayward's affection this though but a flimsy pretext for so awful a crime was all that any one could offer in the way of a surmise the trial was over but one decision could be given it soon was rumored about camp that sentence had been passed and that at four o'clock the next day it would be read to the prisoner in presence of the whole division the night was wearing on a form closely enveloped approached the tent of the commanding general it proved to be the lady alibamo what is the will of our daughter of the army asked the general kindly it is that i may visit lieutenant wells and bring him to my tent i desire that an interview should take place between miss hayward and the doomed man the general seated himself at his table and penned a few words which he handed to mrs hinton she glanced at the contents and then falling at the feet of that officer she seized his hand and kissing it 
sobbingly exclaimed what without his chains god bless you god bless there there go go don't make me weep or i won't forgive you returned the veteran warrior as he turned away alibamo left his tent and in a few minutes entered her own in company with lieutenant wells now free from all apparent restraint when wells entered the tent miss hayward was kneeling by the side of her camp cot her face buried in the folds of its coverings for several moments not a word was spoken and as wells gazed upon the stricken sister he trembled violently while a groan of intense anguish escaped him alibamo advanced and gently touching her companion said mamie my darling here is our friend lieutenant wells miss haywood did not raise her head but reached forth her hand towards wells which quickly kneeling by her side he took and pressed to his lips oh heaven bless you he moaned you do not believe me capable of the dreadful crime with which i am charged miss haywood tried to speak but convulsive sobs choked her utterance no my ever kind and dear friend replied alibamo she does not believe you guilty nor am i satisfied that captain haywood has been killed i am under the impression that he was wounded and taken prisoner by some rebels who were lurking near our camp you hope for the best and so do i but have you any grounds for the formation of such an opinion asked wells yes and to me the best of evidence william nettleton went in search of the captain if he was killed william would have found his body before this and returned to us with the intelligence his continued absence convinces me that the captain is still alive and that his faithful friend nettleton is at this moment following him it is this hope which gives me fresh courage and i believe a few days will see you free and your name as untarnished as it should be i wish to tell you this and i also wished miss haywood to express to you personally her confidence in your innocence hence i brought you here you may leave us now as my poor friend is too much agitated to converse wells was about to depart in silence but miss hayward for the first time raised her face and her tearful eyes met his own he sprung forward and kneeling before her pressed his lips to her white forehead and said that look is worth to me years of happiness but you can read my heart now when i am proved innocent then i will speak the words which must not till then pass my lips god bless you he arose to depart but was met by captain walker who had just entered the tent walker cast a rapid glance around him and placing his finger upon his lips enjoined silence upon all well stood with arms folded sternly and suspiciously gazing upon him while alibamo asked what are your wishes sir to serve you and your friend was the reply spoken in a low voice and with apparent hesitation it must be an important service which could render pardonable the fact sir of you having unannounced and so rudely intruded upon our privacy said mrs hinton it is an important service no less than the rescue of will you be seated the parties seated themselves in silence when walker continued you must pardon me if i speak plainly and directly to the point it is necessary that i should be brief proceed sir miss hayward continued walker turning toward the lady i must give a few words of explanation to you i did love do love you now you need not shrink from me you will upon hearing my words understand me better no man loves without hope until there arises between him and the one beloved some impassable barrier the barrier which arose to blast my hopes was your previous love and the unfortunate circumstance which has made me an unwilling witness against one to whom as i think 
your heart still clings you will please be brief in comment and come as quickly as possible to the point in question replied mrs hinton as she observed the agitation of miss haywood i come to the point now i know miss haywood is very unhappy and i would not add to it i would save her lover to whom do you refer asked wells coldly to you sir was the prompt reply i cannot claim the title you honour me with in connection with that lady besides she might not thank you for such a service oh yes yes eagerly replied miss hayward as she gazed upon the speaker stay one moment miss hayward answered wells let us first learn in what manner my deliverance can be effected captain walker you can proceed you speak very coldly lieutenant wells to one who comes to offer you service but before i proceed i must exact a promise that if my proposition is not accepted those to whom my words are addressed will make no exposure of the same there was a nod of assent and walker proceeded i will not deny the fact that solicitude for miss hayward impels the act but of this no more lieutenant wells you are unbound and unwatched place your sash across your breast as worn by the officer of the day i will give you the countersign and thus you will be enabled to pass the pickets and make good your escape you can secure a safe retreat and after the excitement of the mur of this unfortunate affair has died away miss hayward can be apprised of your place of concealment and take such action in the case as her judgment or heart may dictate a death-like silence reigned for a moment during which rapid glances were exchanged between the friends at length wells asked captain walker would not an escape imply upon my part an acknowledgment of the crime of which i am accused it might in the estimation of many but you are generally believed guilty what matter it what your actions imply to them your friends here who have already made up their minds will merely look upon it as a desire upon your part to escape a certain and unmerited and a dishonourable death and you will assist my flight i will and will you afterward convey miss hayward to me if she will come with pleasure you but anticipate my intended services another rapid and significant glance passed between mrs hinton and wells which was not observed by walker one thing more walker do you believe me guilty of murder hmm i did and now i may have been mistaken but be that as it may i will assist your flight are you ready asked wells rising i wish you to return to your cell and when all is ready say two or three o'clock i will come for you but i will not go was the firm reply walker perceived his mistake and quickly added as you please sir and turning he was about to leave the tent when he was confronted by the officer of the day captain walker he said sternly you feel an especial interest in lieutenant wells i did not suppose so but learn the fact from your conversation i am glad you do feel so great a friendship for him you shall have the opportunity to make it manifest you shall become his pythias what do you mean sir this that the sentence of lieutenant wells will be read to-morrow afternoon at four o'clock in the meantime you as his dear friend do not wish to see him confined and will most cheerfully take his place in the prison and wear his chains if the lieutenant is present to-morrow at four you as his hostage will be released if he should escape as you have advised 
Of course you will be held as an aider and a better in that escape, and when you receive that punishment your guilt deserves, you will have the consolation of knowing that you suffer for the benefit of your very dear friend. Soldiers, commanded the officer, place the irons upon Captain Walker and convey him to the guard room in the old log building. Are you mad? You dare not do it, yelled Walker as he foamed with rage but the soldiers promptly obeyed the command and walker was taken from the tent this indignity shall be avenged but he was carried quickly forward and the guard-room door soon closed upon him you will be at liberty upon your parole of honor until to-morrow at four o'clock lieutenant wells the officers shook hands and separated End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Prisoner of the Milne。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty in Jacksonville, Florida. Prisoner of the Milne by Harry Hazelton. Chapter 6 just as the fading twilight was yielding to darkness and before lieutenant wells had been removed from his cell by request of ali bamo a scene occurred to which we must revert the room in which wells was placed was in the wing of a log house just in the rear of the brick schoolhouse to which we have alluded two doors led from this apartment one opening into the garden the other into the main building this latter door had been firmly secured. Near that opening into the garden was a small window, the only one in the apartment. As the guard was stationed at the door, escape from the room was impossible. Surrounding this garden were a number of hedges, running in various directions, some of them forming the street fence, while others ornamented the winding gravel walks. As soon as it was quite dark, a person closely enveloped and disguised emerged from among the tents and passed cautiously along in the still intenser darkness of the hedge shadow. Ever and anon he would pause and listen. Finally he reached the further hedge, remote from the camp. He paused a moment and then gave a low and peculiar whistle. It was immediately answered, and two men joined the first comer. "'Are you ready?' "'No,' was the answer. "'And why not?' "'Because we have not received our pay.' "'Is that the only reason?' "'The only reason after you have given us full instructions. "'Where is your powder?' "'In the upper part of the garden, under the hedge.' We have secured eight twelve-pound shells which we took from that battery over yonder. Powder enough to blow a mountain to the devil. Well, here is a hundred apiece. When the job is done, you will find as much more in the hollow log that I pointed out last night. Be careful and make sure work. Well, your instructions. You will follow the outer hedge. Creep along with great caution and make no noise. There will be no danger as the guard are not on the north side of the camp. When you reach the log building in the rear of the brick schoolhouse, you will observe a small wing or addition extending to the rear. At the back of this wing you will find an excavation under the house sufficiently large for your shells. Place them in it. Lay your train and then apply the torch. But you must do this with great caution, as a guard is stationed upon the opposite side. Don't be alarmed. Anyone near that old log shanty will go to kingdom come before tomorrow morning. The trio then separated. When Captain Walker was seized and chained by the soldiers, he made a desperate resistance, but in vain. He soon occupied the little room vacated by Lieutenant Wells. The door closed. He heard the clanking of the heavy chains which secured it, and left him in utter darkness. 
he stamped and raved and cursed suddenly starting and wildly clutching his throat as if some terrible thought had crossed his mind he groaned and sunk upon the floor fool oh fool that i was i thought if i pretended friendship and offered to assist in his escape all suspicion of this night's work would be diverted from me but now oh my god what is the hour hark i hear them working under the building no it is not the men yet it is too early i dare not tell the guard for an acknowledgment of any suspicion of such a plot would be a confession of my guilt let me search for some mode of escape walker crawled cautiously around the floor but not a crevice could be found finally exhausted he sunk down giving way to his utter despair an hour two hours dragged slowly by which appeared an age of misery to the wretched man if i give the alarm even saying that a peculiar sound attracted my attention the ruffians who are to do the work will recognize me and i shall thus implicated suffer an ignominious death what is that great god they are at work but they are making so much noise that the guard will hear them and i shall yet be saved don't make quite so much noise in there if you please exclaimed the guard as he knocked upon the door where he was stationed it's not me yelled the frantic man someone is at the rear of the building trying to dig through they want to kill me we will see about that replied the guard as he left his post and walked toward the spot indicated walker fell upon his knees and exclaimed oh i am saved saved that dreadful death he bent down and applying his ear to a small crevice between the logs where the mud mortar had fallen out he listened he could distinctly hear the words spoken have you silenced that damned guard was asked yes cut his wizen no danger hurry with the train of powder gentlemen yelled walker don't go any further i am not the man quick fire the train exclaimed a voice outside a flash was seen and then another said curse it the train has failed throw the torch among the shells and then run walker waited to hear no more but throwing himself with all his violence against the door he set up a series of yells which made the camp ring in a moment steps were heard the door was thrown open and walker livid with fear and frantic staggered into the open air gasping for breath when he had sufficiently recovered his fright to listen the commander of the squad said the powder plot has been discovered sir there is no further danger on that head but you will return to your cell this order walker was compelled to obey and he was again left in darkness with feelings better imagined than described the night wore slowly away lieutenant wells had retired to his own tent his calmness of demeanor certainly did not indicate a guilty mind alibamo too was wakeful and strove by every possible kindness to sustain the heart and hopes of her suffering companion miss nettie morton who had so recently joined their society was occupying a tent in company with miss sally long near that of mrs hinton they also were watchful anxious for the morrow but perhaps the most wretched person in that camp was captain hugh walker no officer would have dared to place irons upon him and confine him in a rough cell upon any slight pretext was it not possible that something of a serious character had been discovered against him this surmise seemed to haunt him for he acted in a manner to indicate the wildest apprehensions of danger morning came at last and slowly the day advanced a guard brought walker his breakfast but the man refused to answer any question during the afternoon he heard the beating of the drums and the bugle blast which he well understood was calling the division together for some important purpose he felt satisfied that one object was the reading of the finding of the court-martial in the case of lieutenant wells but what part was he to play in the scene this was the question which caused his heart to beat with violence as the chains fell from the door of his prison 
and he was called forth. He accompanied the guard in silence, and soon entered the hollow square formed by the three brigades of the division. Walker glanced eagerly around, and there, standing beside the commanding general, was Lieutenant Wells, with Miss Hayward leaning upon his arm, and near them were their female friends. But a few paces distant were the two ruffians who had been engaged in the powder plot. All was silent. The general advanced and said, Preliminary to other proceedings, I wish to ask Captain Walker if he ever before saw these two men. The ruffians advanced, rattling their chains. But Walker drew back, and with forced calmness, he replied, I never have. He dropped his head, gazing upon the ground. The adjutant, who held the sealed orders of the court-martial, by which Lieutenant Wells had been tried, then advanced, and was about to commence reading the document in his hand when a series of yells were heard, and in the distance was seen the grotesque form of Nettleton, as he came bounding along and bellowing, Stop the shootin! Stop the shootin! It was well known throughout the army that Nettleton had remained behind in search of Captain Hayward. As he approached, the most intense excitement was manifest. Lieutenant Wells could scarcely control his feelings, and would have rushed forward to meet Nettleton, had not Mrs. Hinton gently laid her hand upon his arm, begging him to be calm. Miss Hayward clung closer to her lover, as she hoped the news about to be brought by her brother's friend would relieve her agony of suspense. A half-suppressed cheer broke from the soldiers as Nettleton burst into the square. He paused for a moment, his breast heaving and his eyes glaring wildly, but an instant was sufficient for him to discover that Wells was yet alive, and that the object of his suspicion also lived. He sprung forward, and, without uttering a word, seized Walker by the foot, which he at once drew under his arm. Then he as suddenly bounded for the spot where the commandant was standing, dragging the foot along with him. Of course, this sudden movement on the part of Nettleton had thrown Walker violently upon his head, and although he kicked and squirmed and cursed, he was dragged along as if he had been a child. When Nettleton reached the commander, he held the foot of Walker within a few inches of that officer's face and yelled, General, see them boots. Notwithstanding the intense anxiety felt for the result of Nettleton's search, the ridiculous figure he presented in his eagerness, and that of Walker, who was twisting and struggling to escape, a general laugh ran through the division, which was joined in by the commander. Even Wells could not suppress a smile. And what about those boots? asked the commander, after silence had been restored. Why, I blacken them, yelled Nettleton. Another laugh was heard along the line. No doubt you have black on them, but what of this? Why, General, don't you see them two hearts made with nails on the sole of that boot? Certainly I see them, and what then? Walker was now permitted to resume his upright position, and he stood trembling with fear and rage as Nettleton went on to relate his first suspicions of Walker, his search for the body of Captain Hayward, his finding the impression of the footprint standing side by side in the mud at the edge of the stream with the marks of two hearts in the sole of each boot, and then the finding of the handkerchief in the water, which Nettleton then produced. The officer took the white linen witness, examining it closely, and then said, Here is the name of Walker in the corner. William, did you find this near the place where the murder was committed? right by the spot where them two boots stood replied nettleton pointing to walker's feet i can explain this exclaimed walker i went to the river that day to wash and i stood upon the bank to do so i presume i left the impression of my boots there at that time if i did not was i not also present in the morning to examine the spot where the murder had been committed and is it a wonder that the impression of my boots should be left behind that is certainly true replied the general but of the handkerchief it, it fell from my hands as i was washing i did not take the trouble to recover it it is very probable replied the general S so you perceive replied walker as he appeared to gain courage your trumped-up evidence has fallen to the ground i did not expect a combination of both officers and men against me but i i find it so 
and they wish to see me suffer for the bloody deed done by that coward the only reason i can assign for this persecution is that he is in favor with the ladies and you sycophants that you are hope through him to gain favor with his fair companions no doubt that some bargain to that effect already has been effected captain walker had by this time become eloquent and defiant nettleton with his too eager perceptions had failed to foresee the possible fallacy of his proofs for hope and prejudice together had prevented any calm examination of his evidence with a sorrowful and troubled look he turned away this gave walker greater confidence and in a loud but hoarse voice he cried and now i demand justice which you shall have replied the general but first answer me how did this handkerchief which bears your name and which you confessed to having used in the stream become bloody that was another point of interest and nettleton paused to listen attentively i had a bleeding at the nose and the reason i threw the dirty thing away was i did not think it worth washing then some person must have recovered it washed it very carefully and thrown it into the stream again for there is no blood upon it walker attempted a reply but his utterance failed the general enjoined silence and then stepping forward he said in a voice sufficiently loud to be heard by all present captain walker i must sum up before you the evidence of crimes you have committed which have no parallel in the history of the army or of crimes which have ever been or attempted to be committed in any civilized country i would give you the benefit of a court-martial were there any doubt of your guilt and even now may order a trial but it will only be a formal one you had better confess your guilt here before all ask their pardon make reparation to those you have most injured and die repentant i have nothing to confess responded walker bitterly have you no fear of the revelations of these two soldiers asked the general pointing to the chained ruffians i have no fear no doubt they have been bribed to conspire with you but vent your spite go on then captain walker i will briefly enumerate the circumstances which have been developed as well as the facts the morning we left grand prairie you were in command of the squad which escorted the prisoner lieutenant edward wells you had not proceeded far when you were overtaken by two men it was a very easy matter to secure an audience with you as you were in the rear of the division they suggested that you should deliver lieutenant wells to them as their commander had an especial spite against him and wished to secure his person you ask these men i refer to the two ruffians now in chains and standing by your side how they dared to approach you on such a subject and they replied that they had witnessed your act the evening previous and that you need not put on airs with them you then requested these fellows to meet you the next evening at the upper hedge you instructed them to secure a number of pounds of powder for some purpose which you would then explain you met them the next evening you gave them instructions they were about to act upon them when your outcries from the cell in which you had been placed and which lieutenant wells had left only a short time previously attracted the attention of the guard and you were rescued prior to this you had offered to assist lieutenant wells to escape but you wished him to return to his cell and remain until two or three o'clock the fiendish act was to be committed between twelve and one you pretended friendship that all suspicion of the act might be diverted from you have i spoken correctly sir no doubt you have spoken according to the story of the ruffians replied walker you cannot bring against me any respectable proof i look to a court for the justice which i have no reason to expect here look walker who had been shaking like a guilty wretch during the speech of the commander turned in the direction indicated the rough garb had fallen from the ruffians 
their chains were thrown aside and to his astonishment and horror there stood two of the regimental union officers adjutant hinton the husband of alibamo and his friend captain clark walker who now saw how he had been entrapped and detected in his infamy for a moment was utterly unmanned but his resolute nature soon triumphed over his fear well realizing that penitence could not save him he sprung to his feet and said this is all a miserable contemptible conspiracy an effort to make out a case against me to shield that woman's pet from the consequences of his clearly proven crime hayward is dead and cannot be made to answer else you lie you dirty nasty murdering skunk what, what? what? exclaimed a dozen voices he lies the coward that stabs a man in the dark hayward is not dead but lives and will soon by his evidence send this murderer to kingdom come with a shriek miss hayward bounded forward and fell at the feet of nettleton grasping his hands wells who had borne bravely up until this moment covered his face and wept tears of joy and of relief from the imputation of crime sally long sprung to the side of nettleton and throwing her arms around his neck she gave him a hearty kiss which caused him to roll up his green eyes and appear in almost as much agony as if he had been struck in the stomach with a cannon-ball the word was soon passed and the soldiers catching the fire made the very welkin ring with their shouts while the band chimed in with the stirring strain hail to the chief end of chapter six recording by marty in jacksonville florida